everyone, and welcome to the fifth debate of term. This house believes satire is the most revolutionary form of art. Um, it's a little different being on a Monday, but because um, our corporate sponsor debate, which was going to be on a Thursday, they dropped out last minute, but we'd prearranged the debate for um, before on a different day and couldn't move it. So apologies for the slightly awkward timing. Um, in terms of the lineup of speakers today, the way it will work to explain briefly is four paper speakers, um, proposition, opposition, followed by a round of floor speeches from the audience, proposition, opposition, and then another round of floor speeches. Given that we've got four instead of the usual six paper speakers, um, we're going to really try and lean in particularly with audience participation. Um, Without further ado, we should kick off this debate, and I'm delighted to welcome, speaking first, is Catherine Lamb, who has been a private eye cartoonist for over 40 years, um, working to satirise leading political, cultural and intellectual figures. Speaking in proposition of the motion, Catherine, you have the ears of the House. Thank you. Um, George Orwell said, every joke is a tiny revolution. So there you have it, really. Um, <laughs> uh, thank you. <laughs> However, maybe I should elaborate a little bit more, um, if I can find it. Um, satire. The Oxford Dictionary definition is humour, irony, exaggeration or ridicule to expose and criticise prevailing immorality or foolishness. And obviously that's been necessary throughout history, although it was in the 18th century that it really took off, especially with the cartoons by Gilray who is a great um, inspiration to all political cartoonists these days. Um, it, um, Hogarth is uh, known as the grandfather of satire. He used um, satire to expose social ills and encourage reform. And then carrying on, on from Hogarth, uh, Gilray drew the most brilliant cartoons of um, ridiculous people at the time. And uh, these days, um, political cartoonists take inspiration from all these people who have gone before. And so satire is a survival mechanism, really, to stop us all going mad at the horror, injustice and injustice of it all by inducing us to laugh instead of weep. However, I've made it sound just like a coping mechanism. I believe it to be more than that. It is subversive as well and bringing about change. It was vital in establishing freedom of speech in England in the 18th century with the cartoons of Gilray, as I mentioned, Rowlandson and Cruikshank. But in fact, um, they weren't the first, of course. Um, it had been earlier than that with the prints and pamphlets reduced, uh, produced during, uh, during the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation with the um, introduction of printing. So there were prints and pamphlets depicting people such as Luther as being like evil deformed beasts and um, so people discovered that a way to attack each other was through images. And um, obviously images have a, 
an impact, a visual impact, it's very immediate. You have to take trouble to read a few words, but you see a drawing, it's immediate. So they drew these people in order to attack them. They drew them as deformed, strange, odd, misshapen beasts. And this, even going back even earlier, of course, this came from medieval times. And even in um, medieval manuscripts, the artists, even if it was a serious um, discussion of philosophical or religious um, speech or something, um, discussion, uh, the artist in, in the margins, in the illuminations, would introduce these weird beasts. Um, and some of them, some of the images I found particularly interesting, there was a philosoph philosophical tract, really, talking about the various classical philosophers, and it was all very serious. And, um, but the artist, the, me the anonymous medieval artist, had drawn um, a group of these famous philosophers, such as Plato, Aristotle, all involved in deep and learned discussion on a sort of classical balcony thing, setting. And at one end, the artist, the anonymous artist, had put in a monkey with his back to all these men, showing his bottom, eating a piece of fruit. <laughs> and this kind of was symbolic of the fact that these learned philosophers were all a bit boring, dull, uh, pompous asses. <laughs> and so, you know, it's been going on a lot longer than you might think. But obviously, I need to bring it back up to date. And that's where we get to um, the cartoonists, the big political cartoonists working today, such as uh, my esteemed colleague, Martin Rosen, works for The Guardian. And... Um, he uh, also has been, he has um, been inspired by Gil Ray and uh, has taken inspiration from him, particularly from famous images. Cartoonists today will take famous images from history, from the past, uh, such as Gil Ray's The Plum Pudding, um, which uh, Gil Ray drew as... Um, Pitt and Napoleon dividing up the world, depicted as a plum pudding. Um, a cartoonist, contemporary cartoonist called Chris Duggan, reimagined this. Um, Gilray had drawn, well, this is a different cartoon. Um, Gilray had drawn a voluptuary under the horrors of digestion, which was a drawing of George IV enormously obese, a rarely unpopular character. Uh, the cartoonist Chris Duggan had reimagined him as a select committee absentee under the delights of an expense account. And so cartoonists these days do that. They'll take images from the past and use them to convey an, a message about... Um, corruption at the heart of politics today, as it was then, as it still is, as it probably always will be. Um, and I'm sorry to be drum jumping about a bit here, but it, it kind of indicates that this has been going on a long time. I've jumped from medieval times to the 18th century and back to the present so why is this? Why is uh, there always this tendency to laugh, to satirise? I think it is a survival mechanism and it is revolutionary. It doesn't necessarily entail taking to the streets with a placard. It can be a quiet revolution inside oneself, enabling to you to laugh at the sheer horror and injustice that's going on in the world, possibly to act to change it. Um, the 
definition of revolutionary is to involve a great or complete change. Um, and certainly, I, I do admire uh, the cartoonist I've mentioned, Martin Rosen. He, he doesn't hold back with his cartoons. He, um, he has said that there are two things that all human beings have in common, and if you'll forgive me, they shit and they die. <laughs> and um, he plays on both these things, especially the shit. Um, it comes into most of his cartoons. But he does it effectively, and he makes his point. For instance, he drew Tony Blair as a skid mark, <laughs> as a smear of shit. Now, that is an image that probably sticks in the mind. Um, no amount of words might um, stick in the mind as much as that one image. And he also drew Alistair Campbell as a toilet bowl. <laughs> he said that Alistair Campbell was the one person he drew who couldn't take a joke, who was immensely offended, whereas the others were probably secretly delighted because there's nothing worse for a politician than not to be noticed. So uh, having a cartoon dra drawn of them means they've been noticed. Um, but yes, images like that stick in the mind and could possibly bring about a small, quiet revolution or even a bigger one.